<laughs> All right. Oh, hi. Danny, are you feeling okay? You doing all right? Okay. Good. Actually, before that incident, I was going to get up here and say something nice about you, and I guess I might as well just do it anyway. <laughs> but I've had, uh, Pastor Rick is on vacation. I've had a lot of opportunity to, uh, uh, to minister to uh, the dying and to their families this past week. So we've had two, one who went on to be with the Lord and one who was nearing the end of the race. Uh, Bill Scott is going to be with Jesus. And there will be a celebration on Friday. And uh, indeed, uh, yes, at 1.30. And uh, indeed, that is, that is a time to celebrate. When one of God's children goes home with him, oh man, there is rejoicing there. Oh, we don't like to say goodbye, but if we're believers, what we're saying is, see you later. It's a little different. Uh, Bob O'Brien is also very close to the, at the end, and he is now at, uh, at home after having spent several days in ICU uh, this, this past week. And uh, we want to pray for that family as well as he nears that, that time. <clears throat> but everywhere I've gone, they said, oh, Danny was here. What a blessing Danny and Janie are to this church. Oh gosh, it's amazing the uh, the ministry that that uh, that they have. And uh, I, what title did we give you? It was a ministry minister of visitation, something like that, right? If you know somebody needs to be visited, you let Danny know because he'll do it. He sure enough will. And I I hear rumors that you're even singing in ICU these days. <laughs> Uh, that from a grateful family. <laughs> All right. I want to bring you greetings from Pastor Rick. He uh, left me voicemail. And uh, the, uh, the vacation time for him and Emmy is going very well. They're having a relaxing time and uh, hopefully a time of refreshment, much needed. And we'll be returning at the end of this week. He'll be back in time for uh, Bill Scott's memorial service on Friday. But he wanted you to know that he's uh, praying for the folks that are leading here in his absence and also praying for the services this day, praying for you, the family of God at First Southern Baptist of Him. So I wanted to pass that along to you. Well, I wonder if we have anybody here that was a Boy Scout. <laughs> Any Boy Scouts? Okay, there you go. Now I have several out there. And actually, I never was a Boy Scout because when I was the age of a Boy Scout, we had Royal Ambassadors that were pretty active at that time, and so that's what I was. But later, as a, as a pastor, I was pastor of a church that sponsored a Boy Scout troop, and so got to know a lot about Boy Scouts. And uh, they take very seriously their oath mm -hmm. and their law. And uh, their oath says, on my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country and to obey the Scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. Wow, that's pretty good. That just sounds this close to being Christian, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. And you might say, well, they're pledging the Boy Scout law. Well, what is it? It's this. A scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Wow. But you notice that when they take that oath, they pledge it on my honor. On my honor. And it's a matter of, of doing something on their honor for them. Where does your honor take you as a Christian? The Apostle Paul suggested to his younger minister friend, Timothy, that a worthy goal would look something like this. 2 Timothy 2.15 By the way, just, just one scripture today, well, I'll refer to some others, but, but one primary scripture today and yet, if we get this one scripture right, it will mean 
a lot for the kingdom of God. It will mean a lot for this church. It will mean a lot for your life. Take a look at what Paul advised Timothy to do in 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. There are a lot of products that advertise a seal of approval. The good housekeeping seal of approval, or the electrical stuff, UL listed. There are lots of other kinds of approvals. But the right kind of approval is important. And so it is with our own lives as believers. By the way, I need to say, I'm going to preach to believers today. However, if you haven't entrusted your life to Jesus Christ, this could be a very frustrating time for you because there's no way in the world you can be approved by God. At the end, you hang in there and you listen to this. And at the end, I'll share with you how you too can be approved by God. But first, I have a message for the believers from 2 Timothy 2, 15. It's important that we have on our lives as God's people, that word approved. Think about that. Approved by whom? Who is the one to whom we should uh, be concerned about? Who is the one to please? <clears throat> we oftentimes misplace the focus. Who do we try to please in life? Oh, at work we try to please the boss, right? I hope you do. You're probably not employed there too long if you displease the boss. Or we try to, uh, to please our, our spouse, or I'm not quite sure all that this word means anymore, but uh, significant other. <coughs> or our parents, or we try to please our friends, our teachers. Some people even try to please their pastor. You may have to try to please a credit reporting agency. Right? There are all kinds of folks that we try to please. And uh, really a lot of these are important. But in the grand scheme of things, they're of secondary importance. We should first pay attention to the one whose evaluation has eternal consequences. It goes on and on. It's not just for this life, but even beyond. And who would that be? Oh. Who was Timothy told to be pleasing to? to? Oh, to God. To be approved by God. Yeah. Do you think God's checking us out? In Proverbs it says that God is always looking. It says the eye in Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, observing the wicked and the good. Well, that's, that's, that's a good idea because sometimes we might evaluate, our, evaluate ourselves as the good and uh, it might be the other. He's just checking us all out. I ran across a story that I, I really like. It's about a, a, a European craftsman who came to the United States and, and he spent the rest of his life in this country working on the details in the great places of worship. They're great churches, great cathedrals in America. And one day he was working in one of those, uh, those places and a sightseer was coming through the building and he looked up and he noticed this guy way up high, working very carefully, very, very meticulously on a symbol. And this symbol could really hardly even be seen from below. But what was even more interesting was he was working on top of it, the part you couldn't see from below. No matter how hard you looked, you couldn't see because you'd have to have a different angle in order to see that. And he called out to the, to the workman, he said, why, why are you being so careful up there, so exact? No one can see the detail that you're, you're putting into this from a distance. And the workman said, God can. Who was he doing this for? Anyway, one of my favorite stories from the presidency of uh, Lyndon Johnson 
Uh, Bill Moyers was his press secretary. Bill Moyers uh, went to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, has a seminary degree. Anyway, uh, the president asked Bill to offer grace at a meal, and Bill wasn't speaking loudly enough. Because I guess uh, Lyndon had the problem I have. Sometimes you don't hear quite as well as you used to. And in the middle of the prayer, he said, Speak up, Bill, I can't hear you. And without missing a beat, Bill Moyer said, I wasn't speaking to you, Mr. President. <laughs> Who is it that we really are to please? <laughs> God sees. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere. He sees it all. Oh, God really is, is wanting to see some things to approve. You think he's looking because he wants to disapprove? No, he wants to find things that he can approve in our lives. Better than that, he's looking for people to approve. He doesn't enjoy having to note failure. He doesn't enjoy having to, note, uh, having to, to uh, meet out discipline. Uh, sometime back, I heard the noted Christian psychologist Bruce Naramore uh, speaking to a group of ministers, and he said something like this. He said, you've heard people say you should never strike a child in anger. I say it's a sick person that does it for any other reason. You have to think about that. <laughs> do you do it for your pleasure? Guess what? God doesn't punish for pleasure. It breaks his heart if he has to discipline us. No, he's looking for things to find approval in our lives that are noteworthy, that are praiseworthy. I heard a, uh, a report on the news radio sometime back said uh, two remarkable things. Uh, they noted that students were getting higher grades than ever. They also noted that students have the worst study habits in history. I don't mean the subject history, I mean like in history. <laughs> Doesn't that seem contradictory? And what they found was there's a lot of grade inflation. We just tend to give higher grades. Um, well, I really respect the teaching profession. In fact, that's what God, that's what I was going to be before God interrupted my plans and said, no, you're not going to be a teacher, you're going to be a minister of the word. But along the way, I have been a teaching assistant at the university level, and I've been a grader at the seminary level, so I'm, I'm aware of these kinds of things. I don't think God believes in great inflation. Uh, I had a, a, a guy that I, that, that I was doing a program with. The last thing I did as part of my master's program is I was involved in clinical pastoral education, which is a chaplaincy training type thing in an institutional setting, in my case, Baptist Memorial Hospital in Kansas City. And one of the other students, we had an assignment, and he hadn't finished it, and he said, well, it'll be okay. I, don't always, I didn't always get everything done at the seminary, and everything went just fine. They, they, marked, they, they never marked me down. And I was the grader for psychology of religion and pastoral care, Dr. Everett Rainier was was the, the instructor, the professor. And I said to him, Rod, you wouldn't have passed Dr. Rainier's class. I knew because I graded. <laughs> and if he hadn't gotten the work done, he wouldn't have passed. I had a supervisor when I was doing my doctoral program at Golden Gate named Paul Turner. He was a very demanding guy. In fact, he was a legendary uh, villain for many of the students because he was so exacting, so demanding. And uh, his, his thought was, he had to work hard to get his doctorate, and my goodness, nobody was going to get a cheap doctorate under his care. <laughs> and believe me, nobody did. <laughs> and that was really okay for me. I wasn't looking for a cheap doctor. There are other ways to get those. Uh, there's lots of people that have copy machines. I see some things on walls from institutions I've never heard of, and I say, oh, my word, I'd be embarrassed to put that up there. Honestly, I'd just be embarrassed to put that up there. 
Dr. Turner worked us hard, but I could appreciate his honesty. There is no great inflation. A just cause has to call it the way it is. The way it really is, not the way we wish it could be. He doesn't puff up the grades. On the other hand, he really does want to reward us. He's looking for an honest reason to reward us. So, let's look at the unashamed workman. How can we be pleasing to God? What would cause a workman to be ashamed anyway? That's what you'd want to avoid, right? You wouldn't want to do that. What would cause a workman to be ashamed? Well, it might be a result that is less than the ideal. It might be failing to do your best. It might be failing to measure up to what you're really capable of. It might be not taking the task seriously enough to complete it properly. There is work involved, after all. Laziness will bring good results. Paul says to be diligent, to do your best. Well, last time I was diligent, last time I did my best, which by the way, I hope is right now, I found that that involved work. I can't let it slide and do my best. Hmm. The King James Version uh, quotes this a, a little bit differently. Um, and, and a lot of us learn this as children from the King James Version. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study to show yourself, oh, I heard that misquoted many times. They talk about hitting the books. Actually, that's not what it means. It does mean to be diligent. It's, it's not study the way we would think of it today. It means to be zealous, not to be studious. It meant an active relationship to the Word of God, rather than just have a passive knowledge of the truth. <laughs> See, we can know all about God's, God's teachings in the Bible and be unaffected. You can know a lot of stuff that doesn't change your life. I've learned a lot more than I could ever apply in life in all kinds of areas. I've, I've probably forgotten more than I can remember now. It's incredible the amount of stuff that wouldn't fit in my brain. Anybody else like that? No. Oh, that's okay. It's, it's, not, it's not really confession time. We can't be lazy about the Word of God and please God. You see, God doesn't like for His kids to be spiritual slackers. When I was pastor at First Southern Pasadena, they... Uh, a uh, previous pastor left under not really favorable circumstances. And uh, the chairman of deacons there, Mel, uh, Mel Gordon, said that, that that pastor used to brag that he could spend hours developing a sermon. Or he could spend 15 minutes at the last just throwing it together. He said, nobody can tell the difference. And Mel said to me, yes, we could. <laughs> and even if they... Couldn't. God could. God knew. So you can be sure that God can tell the difference if we're giving our best or if we're being spiritual slackers. Is God worthy? Oh, we sang worthy today, didn't we? But did we mean it? Is God worthy of your best effort? then we should be ashamed of anything else. So really, what is the primary task that God wants us to be about? For Timothy, it was to, as it said in the King James Version, to rightly divide the word of truth, or, or to handle the word of truth, to be true to God's word. The Greek word for this uh, rightly dividing or correctly handling is a word for cutting straight. Cutting straight. And a skilled workman would need to use his tools properly and cut straight when using a blade. If we have some seamstresses out there, does it make a difference if you cut straight where the pattern says to cut straight? Can you just cut any direction you want to and it comes out right? Huh? 
Do we have any guys that have a workshop? Maybe gals have workshops too, I don't know. But, you know, does it make a difference if you cut a straight line when a board has to fit in a certain place? And maybe you don't quite get it straight. Does that matter? It does matter. It does matter. So this word means to cut it straight. Make sure you're on track. The Apostle Paul was a tent maker by trade. I think he knew what it meant to cut the fabric straight. Because the tent wouldn't come out right if he didn't cut it right. The Greek word may also mean to, to set a straight course, to not deviate from the goal. See, we're always being pulled aside to this way and that way. Life is like that. Sometimes events just do that, and sometimes the devil tries to distract us. We're pulled to, to other issues, and they're important issues, but they can take us away from the most important issue. And we end up, if you get distracted, you can end up with a line that's just a little bit crooked, and it doesn't work. Don't be distracted when you're cutting the line. In the New Testament book of Acts, it tells about a time in the life of the early church when the apostles were trying to see to the needs of everybody in the church and they had more people than they could see about and they found they didn't really have enough time to study the Word of God so that they could proclaim it accurately. It required some time. And they ended up doing a food distribution ministry which was an important thing. They had that need in the church. It wasn't saying that that was an unimportant thing. But it was a thing that somebody else could do. Somebody else could have that ministry. And so, others were found for whom this was their ministry. And it freed up the apostles to do their ministry. Now, since Pastor Rick's gone, I'm going to talk about him. <laughs> Pastor Rick is a very gifted man. He's gifted in many areas. And his temptation is to do everything in every one of those areas that the church needs. You need to let him know what your areas of giftedness are. You need to volunteer and say, Pastor, I'd love to help. You have anything that comes up in this kind of an area? I'd love to help. Because you know what? If Pastor Rick's doing all of that other stuff, he doesn't have enough time to break the word of life properly. You can help. You can be like those seven that helped the apostles. I would just encourage you to do that. Well, I wonder if he's going to look at this video later. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, if you help, it'll be a good thing. Everybody should be faithful to God's Word. Do you think when Paul was saying this to Timothy, he was just saying, Timothy, you and all the other ordained ministers, this is what you're supposed to do. And everybody else got a, a free ride? <laughs> everybody should be faithful to God's Word. Whether you're a so-called minister or not, we should all be ministers of the Word in that sense. So how can you be faithful to the Word? Well, first of all, you have to spend time in the Word. Amen. You say, Pastor, you're always saying that. Well, just do it. We get everybody doing that, I, I can talk about something else then. Right? Spend time in the Word. Read it. Think about what you read. Don't let your eyes just pass over that page. But what is God saying to you as a result of what you look at? The Bible says meditate on His Word. Meditate. Think deeply about it. Then your way will be, be strengthened in time of need. Then your, your, that way you will know what is right, what is the will of God and what's not. Because you'll know what God's Word says. Every once in a while, every once in a while, I have to look at this because I promised my daughter I wasn't going to take the whole time. She said it was not a sin to get to go to lunch early. <laughs> She's probably starting to lose hope. <laughs> anyway <laughs> it always strikes me as, as odd when somebody has an issue coming up and God's word has spoken to that issue and they say well I just have to pray about it 
And sometimes, now I don't do this because I know it's not really the way to, to get people to come around. But I sometimes feel like shaking them and saying, don't you know what he's already said? You know what his will is. He already said. Recently I was, was dealing with somebody. <laughs> recently I was dealing with somebody that had, a, there was an interpersonal issue between some folks in, in the church fellowship. And, and the, the one person said, well, I'll just have to pray about it. And I'm thinking, Matthew 18 has some things about how you're supposed to handle interpersonal problems. It's already there. What's to pray about? <laughs> but anyway, God said, shut your mouth. You're not going to change any opinion by saying that. So I shut my mouth. And, uh, and God, God uh, brought the situation around anyway. But it's always incredible to me that people have to pray about what God's already said to do. Pray that, that He will help you to do what you're supposed to do. Not tell you what you're supposed to do, because He's already told you. But if you don't spend time in God's Word, you won't know what His will is. You have to get in there. Spend time in His Word. His Word is vital to us. In fact, His Word is like spiritual food. <coughs> Howard Hendricks uh, died earlier this year, great... Uh, Professor at Dallas Seminary for so many years, great teacher of teachers, teachers of preachers. And he wrote this, he said, if you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, you're probably given a piece of paper by a ranger in the park entrance, and on it in big letters is the warning, do not feed the bears. You no sooner drive into the heart of the park, however, than you see people feeding the bears. When I first saw this, I asked a ranger about it. Sir, he answered, you've only seen a small part of the picture. Then he described how the park service personnel in the fall and winter have to carry away the bodies of dead bears. Bears who have lost their ability to fend for food. Wow. And Dr. Hendrick said, this is what is happening to us. Are you just dependent on what the pastor says on Sunday or what your Sunday school teacher says to you about what's in God's Word? Well, it's great that you're getting that. But do you only need to eat twice a week? Some of us might be better if we only eat twice a week. <laughs> Truth is, you need daily bread, the bread of life. You need to take that in and be strengthened daily. And a Christian who isn't into the Bible will quickly become spiritually emaciated, a 98 pound weakling spiritually, an easy prey for the devil to confuse and work over. So you should seek what God wants you to focus on. And you should be faithful to that, just as was Timothy, just as were the apostles. They were called to give first priority to the ministry of the Word. And in that Word, we discover that the primary task in life is to please God. Hmm. And then you please God as you are faithful to what He has given you to do. Ronald Reagan wrote this. He said, General Kelly's words describe the incident. He spoke to a young Marine with more tubes going in and out of his body than I've, than I've ever seen in one body. Those are General Kelly's words. He couldn't see very well. He reached up and grabbed my four stars just to make sure I was who I said I was. He held my hand with a firm grip. He was making signals and we realized he wanted to tell me something. So we put a pad of paper in his hand and he wrote, Semper Fi. Got any old Marines here? No, no old Marines? Anybody ever watch NCIS? <laughs> they say Semper Fi a lot there too. Yeah. All right. Got a Marine there. If, and then Ronald Reagan's comment was, well, if you've ever been a Marine, or if, like myself, you've been an admirer of the Marines, you know these words are a battle cry, a greeting, and a legend of the Marine Corps. They're a Marine shorthand for the model of the Corps. Semper Fidelis. Everybody's up on their Latin, right? <laughs> Always faithful. 
always faithful. I think God's looking for some Semper Fi among His people. And I don't mean He's looking for a few good folks to be Marines. That's a whole different thing. He's looking for a few good folks to be His people. Semper Fi. A Christian who is always faithful. That's what God's looking for. And when you do the main thing well, when you give it your very best effort, you need not be ashamed. You become honorable before God, and you stand approved by the Lord. Well, I don't really have time, because, you know, I had this promise to Karen. But uh, I, don't really, <laughs> I don't really have time to, to read from Matthew 25. But Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30, it's a story that Jesus told about a, a, a man who owned much, and he went away, and he entrusted to his servants, three of his servants, uh, different sums of money. And then he came back. And one of the servants had just hidden the money, and it had nothing. Nothing extra. And the master was not pleased. But the other two had invested, they'd done well with it, they'd actually earned more. And the master's reply to them was, well done. Well done. A diligent worker, a worker who desires only God's approval, need not to be ashamed to present himself and his work to the Master. Oh. I think of Bill's home going. And I just have a sense that there was a well done that was part of that. A well done. Wouldn't you want that to be the case for you? Wouldn't you want to be approved by God? Wouldn't you want to, to be able to hear Him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Share the joy of your Master. May you stand before Him as a worker whose life shows God's approval. In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation hymn. And as we sing, we invite you to respond to what God would have you to do today. You may be... Uh, in need of, of joining this church because God said you need to be part of the church fellowship. And this is the one. Well, come and share that. But I said earlier in the service that if you haven't entrusted your life to Jesus, I would share with you how. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. It's a historical fact, but it's more than a historical fact. You have to make it a reality in your own, own life before your sins can be washed away. But He wants to do that. God gave His Son. He gave the gift of life. But the Bible says, as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to be called the children of God. If you'd like to receive Jesus today, come, confess your sins before Him, trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, He will wash away your sins. You might say, well, I don't know how to do that. That's okay. We've got people that can help. We have folks that do know how to help you with that. And they'll help you pray. You can come to the Lord Jesus this very day. And then you can start working on being approved too. What would He have you to do today? How would He have you to be faithful? Oh, don't make me guess. If He's been talking to you, you already know. And we're going to sing hymn number 305. And as we sing... May it be true of you that you have decided to follow Jesus. Would you stand, please? I have decided. 